students who may have lost work or just can't find work because of the pandemic and maybe don't qualify for the Canada Emergency Response Benefit. That's been something students have been calling for for a number of weeks and the Prime Minister has promised. We're also, of course, continuing to follow developments in Nova Scotia. There are questions that continue today about why the RCMP did not request the province issue an emergency alert during that violent rampage that took at least 22 lives. We are now hearing the U.S. constant in Halifax did alert dual citizens in Nova Scotia. Other people in that province, though, uh, were informed only over Twitter. We know that port a is where the violence began. There's lots of activity there again today, so that's where we are going to start before getting to my colleagues about the Prime Minister's announcement today. And the CBC's Brett Ruskin is standing by. Brett, what can you, uh, what can you tell us about the very latest? Well, Rosemary, it's been kind of a steady stream of vehicles coming and going from uh, the area you see behind me here. This is kind of the police checkpoint that heads down to the port pick crime scene, just one of 15 crime scenes across this part of the province. So we have learned in the last uh, 24 hours or so that uh, the airspace actually above us right now and above the crime scene has been restricted. The RCMP uh, asked Transport Canada to restrict the airspace to all planes, all drones uh, up to 1,500 feet. So anyone who wants to go up, take a look, see what police are doing, they can't do that. Um, updates from police yesterday in a news release was the um, updates from the police news release yesterday was uh, hearing that the uh, uh, death toll had increased to 22 people, 23 including the shooter in this case. Uh, we also heard that the RCMP uniform that he was wearing at the time that he began this shooting in was an authentic RCMP uniform. Still no word yet on how he got his hands on that uniform. Also obviously driving the vehicle that looked almost identical to an RCMP uh, vehicle also. So um, still lots of questions. As you mentioned, questions about why that emergency alert was not activated, why they turned to Twitter instead. And so uh, people are still, you know, asking lots of questions. One more quick note. Um, there have been folks dropping off food and water for the police here in excessive quantities. It has been uh, really, you know, heartwarming to see the community members uh, over the last, you know, few days bringing food, bringing, uh, it has started with individual, you know, Tim's coffees, then big old boxes of Tim's coffees, boxes of donuts, boxes of, uh, of cookies, things like that, trays of sandwiches. Um, it got um, extensive that at one point the police officers came over here to the media on the other side and said, hey guys, do you need some food? Because we have we have lots of food. Um, but it, it's, it's nice to see that the community is really coming together and, and supporting the police officers here as they continue this work, this what will be a lengthy investigation, this unprecedented investigation in its size and scope and, and uh, just the, the tragedy here uh, in Nova Scotia in this part of the province. Just quickly, Brett, there was no press conference yesterday. Instead, the RCMP released a press release only. Any sense on whether they will speak to media today and answer the many questions that, that we still have? Well, let me just touch on that in a moment. I want to just explain what we have here. So um, lots of new RCMP vehicles arriving. Um, it seems as if they're going from crime scene to crime scene. Again, 16 crime scenes in total. The truck with the white cab on the back, that's the forensic officers. Those are the folks who are going to be collecting the evidence, collecting, um, taking pictures and doing uh, evidence collection like that. So this is the type of scene that we see throughout the day, to, uh, the last few days of officers coming and going. As for an update, we know that there is at least a news release coming. No mm -hmm. word yet on whether there will be a news conference in which we can call in and ask questions. Okay, well, I hope that's the case because there are lots of questions and it would be good to be able to get them hope to so. RCMP. Yeah, Brett Ruskin in port pic Nova Scotia again today. Thank you, Brett, appreciate it. All right, let me just bring you up to date on a few counts on uh, what uh, we are facing in this country in, in regards to COVID-19 into the pandemic. I will tell you, first of all, that is the front door of the Prime Minister. He's expected to be out in about 10 minutes time to make an announcement. But uh, just for people in Saskatchewan tonight, the Premier there, Scott Moe, is expected to address his province live tonight. And we do know that tomorrow in that province, officials are scheduled to start talking about how they might be lifting public health restrictions and try to get the economy back and moving. We know, of course, that there are discussions happening in other provinces as well. 
uh, but it really depends on how the pandemic is being contained. Uh, and we also know, and this is the latest update on this front, that long-term care centers in both Ontario and Quebec continue to be the real epicenters of how this pandemic is playing out. 128 outbreaks in facilities in, uh, 128 facilities with outbreaks in Ontario, I should say. Um, and that continues to be a great source of concern for the provinces. And so Ontario just announced this morning that they will be doing some enhanced testing, uh, proactive testing, uh, even if residents or staff are asymptomatic. And certainly they will be going to those hotspots, the places where they know the uh, virus has, has had an outbreak and doing uh, significant testing inside those long-term care centers right away to try and get a handle on this problem. Uh, but let me go back now to my colleagues, Vashi Capellas, host of Power and Politics and the CBC's David Cochran. They are both here, of course, in Ottawa to hear a little bit more about what we are expecting from the Prime Minister. Uh, he had mentioned before that students were still on the government's radar. And we certainly have heard from a lot of students upset that they were very concerned about where they were going to get money, how they were going to save money, whether they would ever get a job. Uh, so tell us what we know at this stage, Vashi. Hey, Rosie. Yeah, I, I think the, the genesis or the, the crux of what we had been hearing from students, or at least what I've been hearing from students, are those who were finishing up school now and then anticipating to come home for May, June, July, and August and work a summer job and use that money to be able to pay for tuition or for whatever kind of schooling that they had coming up in the fall. They were very concerned that because they didn't meet the income threshold of at least $5,000 made last year that is required to access the CERB, that they would not be able to... Uh, access any financial relief or financial aid from the federal government. My understanding is we can expect a very targeted announcement from the prime minister directed towards that group of students. So students who can't access the CRB, it will act very much as a benefit. I'm told that it will be less than the CRB, CRB rather somewhere in the neighborhood of uh, $1,250 uh, $1, a month for the months of May, June, July, and August. I don't know what the conditions are or the requirements are to be able to access that money, uh, but my understanding is it will very much be directed at, uh, at that group of students. On the other uh, item that you mentioned, I do anticipate around long-term care. This is such a uh, an important discussion that's happening right across the country right now. The jurisdiction is provincial, but we did hear the Prime Minister weigh in quite heavily last week and say that he was willing to uh, top up the pay for essential workers, but that required conversations with the provinces. The last conversation I had with government officials yesterday on that were that those talks were difficult and taking a long time, and they didn't anticipate an announcement before the end of the week. But given the sort of uh, you know acute nature of the problem in long-term care centers right now across the country, I think that uh, sort of time is of the essence, or at least that's what we're hearing from groups that represent those workers. And so uh, it will be interesting to see if he has anything to say on the development of those talks. Okay. And, and David, from your end, uh, what, are, what are you hearing about what the Prime Minister will likely say? Yeah, this is not going to be a tweak to the CERB. What I'm essentially being told is this is going to be an entirely new program aimed directly at students. It's going to have the income replacement that Vashi outlined of up to $12.50 a month, but then also a series of grants and grants for volunteering so that if you mm. find some way that you can volunteer during this, depending on the number of hours that a student puts in, uh, you're going to be eligible for some cash from the federal government there. Uh, some students will be able to qualify for CERB, so this is aimed specifically at the people who do not qualify for that. And by having money there for volunteering, and I think there's also a component that allows you to work as well and make a little bit of cash, because maybe you can get 10 hours a week somewhere, um, they want to set this up to encourage you to volunteer in a way that gets you some experience. So right. it'll get you money, but it also, as a student who may be finishing a program, because I'm, I'm told this will help graduates who are finishing their programs and going into the workforce, it lets you point to something that you were able to do in a professional capacity during this pandemic crisis so that you can build some experience that helps you transition from school to workforce when all of this eventually is lifted and things start to go back to normal. So it's putting that financial floor under students who were missed mm -hmm. by the other program and then allowing them to sort of find other ways that they can help out and be financially compensated for it because there is an urgent need for, for volunteers uh, yep. you know Rosie like we've seen with like on meal delivery for seniors or maybe helping someone with a disability get to a medical appointment this sort of a thing so they've been trying to build that out as as giving money to groups like the United Way and other organizations mm -hmm. now a way for to mobilize a potential underused workforce and volunteer force to help with that while making sure they get some money they need to transition or to help pay for school when eventually classes resume.
and, and put some things on their CV, which is often what yeah. these these summer jobs are, are about. Speaking from experience, and I'm sure everyone else does too. I'll also remind everybody that that the issue with the CERB for students is that you have to have made uh, five thousand bucks in the past twelve months, and sometimes, as you pointed out, that's that's possible, and sometimes it's not. Um, and so that that's where a lot of students sort of fell through the cracks. Um, although they they did also uh, just to remind people make some temporary changes to the Canada Summer Jobs Program. Uh, that has now been extended, I believe, all the way until February now, um, and they are funding more of that um, of that grant program as well. And, and Vashi, that too, uh, those combined measures, if, if everything we're saying here is, is is about right, those combined measures would certainly capture much more people than than previously. Yeah, it seems like that's the intent of the government. Whether that's realized or not, I think depends on the on the granular details. It also, for example, with the Canada Summer Jobs Program, depends on how that extension works. We're hearing, for example, that a number of the applications, the extended applications beyond the normal period, have to go through MPs offices. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So I think, you know, again, the, the details and how many jobs that actually, extra jobs, I think they said it would create up to 70,000 additional jobs. Well, uh, yes. you know, does that actually happen? Over what period of time? Does it help the students that it's intending to? I mean. Obviously, the intent is there, but uh, whether or not it materializes, I think, is is still an unanswered question, and obviously, we'll take some time uh, to get some answers on that. Same thing with the announcement today. Does it actually end up helping the people who still need the help, who can't access the CERB, as, as you and David point out? Uh, it sounds like, as a separate benefit, it will, uh, but if, is that amount of money enough to help with tuition, et cetera, et cetera? I think, I, you know, it just depends how it all works out. <laughs> can, can I, I just want to turn back, if I can, to uh, the ongoing story in Nova Scotia. Scotia, because I, I, I think one of the things that has emerged fairly clearly is that the lack of emergency alert uh, for that province uh, certainly left some people uh, in the dark about what was happening. Um, and and it is uh, well known that in that in, in Nova Scotia there are more people on Facebook than on Twitter. So the RCMP choosing to send things out just over Twitter uh, did decrease their their reach, if you will. And now hearing today that the U.S. consulate in Halifax did send out an alert to dual citizens uh, to to make sure that they knew that it was happening. I mean, these are all very uh, curious uh, curious things. Uh, and the RCMP didn't give a press conference yesterday, uh, and the premier said that he had everyone in place to to issue this alert and it didn't happen um, I don't know who wants to weigh in there maybe David do you want to start I just I, I, I to me it's perplexing and I'm sure it is to many Canadians that the one system we have created for these kinds of measures wasn't used well you know Rosie if there's one common theme of the last several months uh, in world politics at every level is why did leaders make the choices they made at the point that they made them and why didn't they consider other options and this is been writ large throughout the pandemic and certainly uh, on a very particular case uh, with this tragedy in Nova Scotia. I, I think the explanation that has been given is that this was what they thought would hit the most people, um, but that doesn't explain why you didn't use every option if mm -hmm. your goal mm -hmm. is to hit all the people. Um, so, you know, there are so many facts we do not know. There is so much fog around everything that is happening really in the world, but particularly around this particular incident. Um, but I suspect that will be one of the primary questions. I mean, Often a lot of the safety response improvements we have in a country are born out of sure. fail failures and earlier tragedies. And uh, this certainly seems like an interesting one because, you know, we have heard from people who said, had an alert gone out on the phone systems, I would not have allowed my loved one to leave the mm -hmm. house and, and mm -hmm. go to their job and go to their work. So this is a, an acutely important question that I think people want an answer to and certainly deserve an answer to. I don't suspect we will get an answer on this from the Prime Minister today because of no. the ongoing investigation and his reluctance to, to weigh into the middle of that. Yeah, that, that's for sure. And I'll, I'll just let people know that the RCMP in Nova Scotia have about 92,000 Twitter followers uh, mm -hmm. and the population is close to a million. So just that would give you a good sense of who they were and were not reaching uh, at the time. So I, I think there is some uh, certainly some accountability for the RCMP on that issue. Um, but again, we don't know yet whether the RCMP will give a media briefing today or take any questions. Uh, we are standing by for the Prime Minister, who's about a minute away, I hear. Um, and he is again today going to speak about 
about some of the Canadians that the government wasn't able to capture in its uh, in its initial policy response to the pandemic as they try to uh, secure people um, economically uh, over the next we don't know how long, frankly. Um, and this time today, it will be students. And Vashi, I don't know if you want to weigh in, uh, maybe on the wage subsidy program too, which starts in, on Monday, and that is of significant importance for lots yeah, of businesses it's, too. Yeah, it's a really significant one. I'll keep my eye there on the screen, Rosie, so that sure. I cut myself off when the Prime Minister emerges. But uh, yesterday we got details that businesses can, as of right now, go on the CR, CRA's rather website and figure out how, if they're eligible and to what degree uh, for the wage subsidy program. They can then apply on Monday and they should, 90% of them, the government says, should have the money that they initially apply for it deposited in their bank accounts or whatever, through whatever mechanism uh, ends up working uh, by about a week later. So uh, that is a big deal to a lot of businesses that are counting on that. I would highlight one other thing, though, and that is around the commercial rent piece that so many uh, businesses have been talking to us about and raising with us as an outstanding issue. Alongside that talk with the premiers that the, that the prime minister was going to have, around essential workers was also a discussion around a commercial rent relief program in which the federal government would somehow backstop loans to property owners who would then in turn have to offer rent relief to tenants. Uh, no word yet on how those discussions are going and I would only point out that May 1st is, you know, I'm looking at the calendar right now, eight days away, mm -hmm, uh, mm -hmm. around eight days away. So, so a lot of concern from businesses still around that rent relief. Uh, obviously, again, provincial jurisdiction, but the federal government weighing in. So uh, yeah. something else to watch for. And a hard to negotiate when you've got multiple jurisdictions for sure. For okay, sure. here is the Prime Minister of Canada giving us his latest update. I want to talk about the latest updates coming out of Nova Scotia. The RCMP has now confirmed that at least 22 people were killed in this weekend's terrible attacks. And we're learning more about those who were taken from us. We're seeing just how much each of them was loved. Again, I want to extend my deepest condolences to all friends and families of the victims. No that Canada is standing with you. We now know that at least 22 people lost their lives in the tragedy that occurred in Nova Scotia. We are starting to learn more, more about the victims, and we are seeing just how loved they all were. Once again, I want to extend my deepest condolences to the families and friends of the victims. The entire country stands with you. Right now, in incredibly difficult times, Canadians are reaching out to support each other. People are asking what they can do to help. I heard a great story of a young person here in Ottawa named Felix, who's one of those people putting up his hand. A recent engineering grad from Carleton, he'd been working on communications satellites. A few weeks ago, he talked to a local manufacturer about what they could do in the fight against COVID-19. Now, they've started designing and creating reusable face shields for frontline workers. And Felix isn't the only one stepping up. From coast to coast to coast, young people are pitching in and doing their part. So we're going to do the same for them. Many students are eligible for new programs we've brought in over the last few weeks. Many students will get the Canada Emergency Response Benefit, but others won't. And that leaves some young people worried about what they're going to do. COVID-19 has meant that there aren't as many jobs out there for students. And without a job, it can be hard to pay for tuition or the day-to-day -day basics. You might normally have turned to your parents for help, but right now, mom and dad are stretched too. And even if monthly bills aren't the concern, you may have been counting on the summer job for next year's tuition or to get the right experience for your career. As young people, what you're going through matters. And we want to make sure that you'll be okay. So today, I'm announcing our plan to support students right across the country. We're launching the Canada Emergency Student Benefit to provide immediate help. At the same time, we will create new student jobs and double student grants, among other things. All of these measures will add up to approximately $9 billion for students. For today, for the summer, for next year. We're going to be there for you. So let me start with the Canada Emergency Student Benefit. Right now, you might be worried about how to make ends meet. You probably can't work your normal job, and that might be a big problem for rent or for groceries. So we're bringing in the Canada Emergency Student Benefit to help. 
With this benefit, you'll get $1,250 a month from May to August. And if you take care of someone else or have a disability, that amount will go up to $1,750 each month. This benefit is designed for you. If you're a post-secondary student right now, if you're going to college in September, or if you graduated in December 2019. It's there for you even if you have a job, but you're only making up to $1,000 a month. The period covered by the benefit will start on May 1st, and your payments will be delivered through the Canada Revenue Agency. We'll be working with opposition parties to move forward on legislation to put this new benefit in place. Aujourd'hui, Today, we are introducing a $9 billion program for students. We are introducing the Canada Emergency Student Benefit to help people who are going through tough times because of COVID-19. From May to August, you will receive $1,250 a month. And if you are caring for another person or you are living with a disability, you could receive $1,750 per month. This benefit was designed to help you. If you are in school now or will be in school in September, or if you graduated after December 2019, you are eligible. And if you have a job, but you're earning $1,000 or less per month, you are also eligible. The payments will be retroactive to May the 1st and will be paid through the Canada Revenue Agency. We will be working with the opposition parties to get the bill passed that will allow us to introduce this new benefit. For a lot of students, the month of May normally marks the start of a summer job. But right now, it might be really tough to find something. You may have been looking for weeks without any success. So we're going to help. Our government is creating 76,000 jobs for young people, in addition to the Canada Summer Jobs Program. These placements will be in sectors that need an extra hand right now, or that are on the front lines of this pandemic. We're also going to be providing specific support for Indigenous students. And for student researchers and graduate students, we're going to invest over $291 million to extend scholarships, fellowships and grants to make sure you can keep working. Depending on your funding, it'll be extended by either three or four months. Of course, a paying job isn't the only valuable way to spend your summer. Volunteering can be a fantastic way to build skills, make contacts or just give back. If you're volunteering instead of working, we're going to make sure that you have support, too. Students helping in the fight against, against COVID-19 this summer will soon be eligible for $1,000 to $5,000, depending on your hours, through the new Canada Student Service Grant. Your energy and your skills can do a lot of good right now. If you are a student, it's tough finding a summer job now because of COVID-19. Our government, therefore, will be creating 76,000 additional jobs for young people in those sectors that need help right now or are contributing directly to our response to the pandemic. These jobs that are in addition to the ones under the Canada Summer Jobs Program. We will also be providing targeted help to Indigenous students. Students. And with respect to research, we will be investing more than $291 million to extend grants and fellowships by three or four months and therefore allow them to continue their work. At the same time, we are currently introducing the Canadian Student Service Grant. If you want to volunteer to help fight COVID-19 this summer, you will be able to receive from $1,000 to $5,000 depending on your hours. We need your energy and your skills. Things may be hard for the next little while, but we're going to support you through it. We're doubling the student grants that the government gives out for the 2020-21 school year. For students in Quebec, the Northwest Territories and Nunavut, we will be providing funding to the provincial and territorial governments so that they can increase their financial aid programs. At the same time, we will provide over $75 million to increase support specifically for First Nations, Inuit and Métis Nations students. Aujourd'hui, j'annonce aussi...
Today, I'm also announcing that we will double the amount of money being, prepared, being uh, provided for 2020-21. And for students in Quebec, the Northwest Territories, and Nunavut, we will be granting that funding to provincial and territorial governments so they can extend their own financial assistance programs. At the same time, we will be investing more than $75 million to support Inuit, First Nations, and Métis students. For all the students watching today, let me say this. As you're building your future, thinking about how to contribute, about starting a family or a career, all of a sudden, you're faced with a massive crisis. This uncertainty that you feel can be overwhelming. But in Canada, we look out for each other. We value education, service, hard work. These measures will help you get through this so that you can build that career and the future that you've been looking forward to, that we've been looking forward to for you. On the other side of this, when the economy comes roaring back, you will define our path forward, a path towards a better, more equal society. That's what we're doing together. Today, on Earth Day, we are reminded that the way forward includes a healthy environment and a strong, sustainable economy. Although our immediate focus is on the fight against COVID-19, we will always do our part to build a brighter future for tomorrow. Today, Earth Day rem reminds us that we must reconcile a sustainable economy and a healthy environment. Even though right now we are concerned about fighting COVID-19, we will always do what needs to be done to build a better future for our generation and future generations. I know that in the last six weeks our lives have changed in one way or another that right now the future may seem even more uncertain. But whoever you may be, whether you're a student, uh, an essential worker, or a business owner, we are there for you. We need for you to do your part as well. So please continue to stay home, wash your hands, and keep a two-meter distance from others. Thank you very much. Merci beaucoup, Monsieur le Premier ministre. On va passer à la période de questions, en commençant par le téléphone. Modérateur, c'est à vous. Thank you. Merci. Première question, Raymond Fillon, TVA. À vous. Good morning, Prime Minister. I'd like you to comment on the horror stories that we're hearing in many seniors' home, people who are dying alone uh, uh, with no food, there's a terrible lack of staff. Uh, yes, this is a provincial jurisdiction, but given the seriousness of the situation, do you intend to intervene and respond? Yes, we are helping the provinces, uh, and we are going to provide the necessary support to them. We are working with them now to ensure that uh, employees who work and have very low incomes will receive uh, supplemental income. And we are currently uh, putting regulations in place uh, to ensure that our seniors can be protected. But we all know that this is an extremely serious situation for our seniors. And in seniors' homes across the country, we're seeing the effects of COVID-19. People who are working in these homes are always doing an outstanding job, but now it is an even more difficult job. And as a society and as levels of government, we must do more to protect our seniors. Follow up. Do you think that Quebec is in control of the situation right now? We're talking about a very serious lack of staff. Are there people you can stand in now? And if uh, so, why have they not been deployed? in addition to a potential military contribution. We have received requests from Quebec for assistance, and we did send in the army. We continue to work with Quebec to provide as much help as possible, but we know that Quebec is working very hard to resolve that situation. Thank you. Merci. Next question, Theresa Wright, the Canadian Press, line open. Good morning, Prime Minister. Uh, could you please explain why will you not make the CERB a universal benefit? 
We just move forward in support for students today. The Canada Emergency Response Benefit uh, is there for people who lost a paycheck. We recognize that because of COVID-19, uh, there are many people out of work who were counting on a paycheck to be able to pay for their groceries, to be able to pay their rent. And those people are helped by the CERB. Uh, we now uh, are moving forward with direct help for students. Uh, in many cases, post-secondary students, school year uh, ends or term ends uh, now at around the end of April and normally at the beginning of May they'd be looking for uh, summer jobs. Uh, this is something that obviously is not going to happen the same way or as easily this year. That's why we're moving forward uh, with the Canada Emergency Student Benefit uh, that will help students who can't find a job. But on top of that, we're going to be helping uh, students uh, across the country by creating new jobs, by finding areas where young people can serve, can contribute, can get jobs. And if they volunteer, we're going to be rewarding them for volunteering as well. We need to create a range of measures to support uh, young people and that's what we've done today to the total of nine billion dollars. At the same time we recognize that there are further gaps that we need to continue to work on in terms of covering. We've moved very fast for most people but we continue to work with uh, allies and opposition parties and partners in uh, across uh, areas in the country to deliver more help to those who need it. Follow-up hey. question? Today, we are announcing support for students. The Canada Emergency Response Benefit is already helping many people who've lost a paycheck, and we need it to help those people. But we also recognize that students who are finishing their school year would normally be looking for jobs uh, now and for the summer. They will have a tough time finding one, so we will be creating new jobs in sectors where they can make themselves useful. At the same time, we are also delivering an emergency student benefit to ensure that those students who can't find jobs will have money to be able to pay their rent and their groceries. Follow-up question? With all due respect, I don't believe you answered the question. We've heard many Canadians who are falling through the gaps. You, you've even said so yourself. There's a growing push for universal benefits. So why is this something that you are not doing at this point? Our focus at this point and from the very beginning it has been on getting help to people who needed it. Uh, there are millions of Canadians who need help. There are others who do not need help. And we feel, felt and we feel that targeting the maximum amount of help to the people who needed it quickly was the right way uh, to begin to get through this process. That's what we did with the Canada Emergency Response Benefit that is delivering that help uh, to over 8 million Canadians already. Uh, we need to do more. That's why we're announcing the Canada Students Benefit. But our approach has been to give as much help as possible to the people who need it. That's why uh, we took the approach that we did. Our approach in this situation and in this crisis has always been to provide as much help as possible to those who need it. There are millions of Canadians who need the emergency response benefit and who need the wage subsidy. So we moved very quickly to, de to deliver those two programs. But there are other Canadians who do not need uh, help at this time. Uh, these people continue to work and receive a paycheck. And therefore, we can uh, give the money uh, to the people who need it most instead of giving it universally. We need to be there for each other, and we decided to give precedence to the people who need help. Thank you. Merci. Prochaine question, Marie Vastel, Le Devoir, à vous. Good morning, Mr. Trudeau. I'd like you to comment on the uh, plans of certain provinces to lift the lockdown. They're saying that slowly they have to reopen their economy, and this is urgent. Are you comfortable with the beginnings of this uh, relaxation of rules? And will you be giving some flexibility to the provinces in terms of the border with the U.S.? Can you clarify what you meant? For example, could the provinces reopen their border with the U.S. 
before a federal order in council uh, ends at the end of April? Or is your flexibility uh, meaning to only do that later on? Well, first of all, we all recognize that the pandemic is uh, rolling out differently in different provinces and regions, and therefore the provinces and territories will be making their own decisions as to the next steps when it comes to reopening the economy. But we are working with the provinces uh, in close coordination to ensure that our principles and our approach are similar right across the country so that people will understand what's happening in their area and across the country. With respect to the U.S. border, the measures that are now in place until May 21st will remain in place right across the country. And uh, in terms of what happens after May 21st, we will have more discussions with the United States and probably with the provinces as well on that. But this is a cross-Canada measure. We recognize that different provinces will uh, make different decisions about how and where to uh, start restarting and reopening their economies. Uh, we are going to work to coordinate so that we're basing ourselves on uh, shared values, principles and scientific uh, approaches right across the country. But yes, provinces will take their decisions that we will work to try and coordinate in a, a cohesive story for all Canadians. In regards to reopening the border with the United States, that is a uh, federal and national decision that uh, we uh, have brought in that we will continue to coordinate with the United States. Uh, but uh, the national measures will apply uh, right across the Canada-U.S. border, uh, regardless of provinces or jurisdictions. En suivi. Follow up. Merci. Et, uh, Thank pour you. À, à la and coming back to the situation in Quebec, more than 50% of the deaths in Canada are in Quebec facilities. As a Quebecer, what does it mean to you to see this? And in concrete terms, what can the federal government, even though this is a provincial jurisdiction, but what can you do on the ground other than um, beefing up people's wages and helping people with rent? What can you do on the ground? to try and flatten that curb and lessen the number of deaths that are occurring. We respect provincial jurisdiction, and I believe that Quebec is doing a good job in managing those issues. But obviously we are there as a federal government to provide aid when it's needed and when Quebec asks us for that aid. We sent in the CAF to Quebec. We have not done that elsewhere in country because this was a request from Quebec. We also provided direct support through other measures that will help, uh, for example, regulations with respect to seniors' homes that are applied across the country and that uh, are in full alignment with Quebec's decisions. We are there to be a partner and support Quebec and uh, respond to any requests for PPE, for example, uh, which Quebec has asked for. The federal government has its role to play, but we will always respect uh, provincial jurisdiction and support them in uh, responding. Thank you. Merci. Next question, Rajin Saini, Parvasi Media Group. Line open. Prime Minister, good morning. This is Rajin Saini from Toronto. Uh, Prime Minister, uh, last week, uh, government decided decided to decrease the lower limit of payroll to 20000 to qualify for $40,000 loan. This is a welcome step, but still there are many small businesses like small restaurants, convenience stores, bakery shops, dry cleaners, who won't be able to get this benefit because of many reasons. There are businesses, these are businesses already struggling. Now we have got a report today that in Toronto, two-thirds of these businesses won't be open after three months. What government is considering to help these businesses? We know that businesses, particularly small businesses, are facing an extremely difficult time uh, through COVID-19. And we need to support these small businesses, not just because uh, they are main drivers of our economy and of our employment right across the country, but because we need them uh, to be in good shape 
when this COVID-19 crisis is through so that they can come back. That's why our focus has been on helping uh, workers who lose a paycheck and people who lose their jobs with the Canada Workers Subsidy and the, uh, and the Canada Emergency Response Benefit. Uh, we also recognize that small businesses, including the smallest businesses, uh, need help with access to credit, which is why we put in place a $40,000 loan with a $10,000 uh, uh, $10, non-repayable uh, non element that is going to be uh, helping small businesses significantly. As you said, uh, we heard from some very small businesses that uh, weren't qualifying when we had the threshold at 50,000, which is why we dropped it down to 20,000, which is the equivalent of a uh, one full-time worker at minimum wage uh, for the year. That, that was the threshold that we uh, determined was right for small businesses. We recognize that there are other small businesses that uh, are not getting the support they need because of particularities in their circumstances, and we are continuing to work with finance and with uh, business associations uh, to make sure that we're giving these small businesses the support they need not just to get through this difficult time, but so to make sure uh, that they come back strong at the end of it. On a follow-up? Uh, Prime Minister, the uh, Canadian government is doing its best to bring Canadians back home, but there are 20,000 Canadians stuck in India right now. Many of them are children, ailing seniors. Their families are worried about their well-being. They are frustrated that Canadian High Commission office in New Delhi has not been able to provide them timely help. Even our High Commissioner there has apologized to them for this situation. Is Prime Minister's office aware of this situation and any immediate help for them? Uh, we are very aware of the challenges faced by Canadians all around the world who want to return to Canada uh, at a time where international flights are extremely limited. Uh, we continue to work with governments around the world, including the Indian government. We have welcomed over the past month uh, about 20,000 Canadians home through repatriation flights. Uh, they all uh, go into quarantine when they're home to make sure that they're not increasing the risk of COVID-19 to everyone else. Uh, but it is important to be able to bring home Canadians. Uh, there are particularly high demands in some parts of the world, uh, including India, that we are working very, very hard day and night to try and resolve. There have been many flights back from India, but there is a need for more. Bonjour, Monsieur le Premier ministre. Louis Blouin, Radio Canada. Louis Blouin, Radio Canada. Good morning, uh, Prime Minister. Now, there's a union saying that they've received new rules with it when it comes to asylum seekers. Now, obviously, Roxham Road remains closed, but people coming into official border points will be able to apply for a refugee uh, status and be sent to a hotel. So, what exactly has happened at the border? Is the safe third party agreement still in place. We need some clarification on this. Based on what I know, the safe third country agreement is still in place. If there are new directives, we will be following up to give you that information. But have things changed since last night? Not as far as I know, but I know that Minister Blair will be able to provide more information as to whether or not there are changes. As uh, far as I've been apprised, there haven't been any changes that are posture in the border. Uh, but if there have been changes, I'm sure Minister Blair will be able to uh, fill you in on those. On the question of the guaranteed, guaranteed minimum income, do you not think it would have been simpler to put in place a more universal program, more open, uh, administratively speaking? In other words, create a single benefit. Rather, uh, why not do that? Were you afraid of significant abuse? Well, there are two uh, aspects to a universal benefit. There are some people who think it would have been a simpler solution, but it wouldn't have been much simpler and maybe not simple as all uh, in terms of uh, its administration. It's not just as simple as sending a check to every single Canadian, whatever their age or wherever they live. It's always a bit more complicated than that. And second, and this is the major reason, we decided to help uh, first and foremost, and as much as possible, 
responsible, the people who really need help. So all of these measures we introduced uh, recognize that people have lost jobs, have lost their income because of COVID-19. Uh, it's not their fault, and they need income in order to pay for their groceries and support their family and pay their rent. That's why we chose to move in a targeted fashion very quickly to deliver assistance uh, to these people who need help. And that's exactly what we did. We see that more than 8 million Canadians are receiving the Canada Emergency Response Benefit, and we have just announced support for students as well. And there will be future announcements to help other people who need help. Prime Minister, yesterday you said you would proceed with gun control legislation at the appropriate time. We've seen other countries, Australia New Zealand, act very quickly after mass shootings. Why do you think this isn't the appropriate time? And do you not believe the Parliament can't deal, even in their limited form, with two pressing issues at the same time? Uh, we are certainly looking at uh, reintroducing or introducing our uh, new gun control measures that were ready to go before Parliament was suspended of the COVID uh, because of COVID-19. Uh, the uh, rules around the unanimous consent motion that uh, governs the return of Parliament in a reduced state specifically state that we need to uh, only introduce measures that are related to COVID-19, uh, but we will certainly be seeing with other parties if there is an appetite to move more quickly given, uh, given the measures in place, given the, the tragedy uh, that we just had. Uh, we were almost uh, in the position of where we could introduce uh, that bill before Parliament was suspended, and we're making plans to introduce it very soon. The condition of a Parliament uh, meeting in restricted numbers means uh, that uh, the legislation now that we introduce must be related to COVID-19. But we are prepared to speak to the other parties to see if they're prepared to move more quickly uh, on strengthening gun control. Are comparatively modest to things that have been done in other countries, uh, particularly Australia after the Port Arthur massacre in 1996. Are you willing now to revisit the, the measures that are before Parliament and strengthen them, uh, particularly with regard to ownership of restricted weapons like handguns and certain kinds of uh, semi automatic rifles? Uh, we made some very strong commitments in the last election campaign on strengthening gun control. We saw there was a significant debate in this country that continues uh, between parties that are in favor of strengthening gun control and other parties that uh, want to weaken gun control. Uh, there continues to be a need for debate in this country, but we are resolute that we need to move forward on strengthening gun legislation, on strengthening gun control uh, in uh, smart, common sense ways, and on on banning uh, assault-style weapons from this country. They have no place uh, in our communities, in our country, and that's why we will be moving forward with legislation to ban them. Hi, Prime Minister Tom Perry with CBC. Uh, you said in your announcement you're making 76,000 jobs for young people uh, and that these placements are going to be in sectors that need an extra hand right now and are on the front lines of the pandemic. Can you clarify where that's going to be? I mean, we've heard from farmers who need help. We've heard about contact tracing, meeting people there. Where are these students going to be working? Uh, these are the kinds of things we're looking at. We're looking at uh, help on contact tracing. We're help, uh, looking at uh, sectors that need uh, extra support, perhaps agriculture and others. Uh, there are uh, a number of uh, ways that we're looking at it right now. Uh, we will have more to say in the coming days as we develop this. But we know young people want and need uh, good summer jobs. and. Uh, uh, we're going to try and uh, make sure that they can get them. And you talked uh, earlier about uh, seniors' homes and the, the, the tragedy unfolding there. The government has announced um, support for, for uh, essential workers there. I'm wondering, has there been much buy-in? Is that actually helping anyone yet? And as you look further ahead, this is a provincial responsibility. Do you see a greater role for the federal government in ensuring a uniform standard of care? And is that something you're going to be raising with the premiers? We've seen a couple of provinces like uh, BC and Quebec move forward on support for uh, essential workers who are uh, low paid but in uh, important areas like in long-term care facilities. Uh, that's why uh, we are talking with provinces about expanding and supporting them in those programs. Uh, there have been discussions ongoing with the provinces recognizing, uh, as was pointed out, that it's very much a provincial area of jurisdiction, but uh, we recognize this is a problem that uh, we want to help with. Um, I think the larger question that we're all facing is, uh, is a, an understanding that 
in many parts of this country, in many places across this country, the people who care for our most vulnerable are themselves quite vulnerable. And I think uh, we need to have a reflection as we get through this crisis and certainly after it on how we ensure that the people who are taking care of our most vulnerable are not themselves vulnerable. I think it's clear that we're working now with the provinces to help them with, to address all sorts of situations, including in seniors' homes. But I think we will have to reflect as a country and as a society on how we can ensure that the most vulnerable, vulnerable people are not being helped by people who are also uh, extremely vulnerable. We need to ensure that the people uh, doing that very important work uh, of caring for elderly and vulnerable Canadians are not themselves uh, extremely vulnerable economically. Janet Silver, Global News. Just to follow up on seniors, um, there have been a number of announcements today for students, uh, previously for businesses, etc. I'm wondering specifically in terms of seniors and recently retired people who have lost all their savings or substantial amount of savings due to COVID-19, will there be help for them? Yes, there is co help coming for seniors. We uh, recognize that the first priority was getting income replacements to people who had lost their incomes, lost their jobs. That's what we did with the Canada Emergency Response Benefit and with the, uh, the uh, wage subsidy. Now, as the school year comes to an end uh, in April for university students, uh, we're moving forward with support for university students because they are going to need help in finding a job and getting income replacement uh, at a time where they were going to be counting on uh, money to help them pay rent, pay groceries. Uh, at the same time, even though uh, many seniors continue to have the same fixed income they had from the government, from pensions, uh, there are concerns both about their long-term savings, uh, which is why we may change on the RRIF withdrawals, uh, but we also recognize that the cost of living has grown, uh, gone up for seniors as they are facing uh, challenges because COVID-19 targets seniors to a greater degree. So we're working right now on measures for seniors. I want to thank uh, the other parties who have made excellent suggestions, and we will have more to announce in the coming days. Okay. Nous avons we decided to give a priority to people who had lost their paychecks because of COVID-19. With the wage subsidy and the response benefit, we are helping those people who really needed help right away, as soon as the COVID-19 situation began. And today, because we're coming to the end of the school year for students in the post-secondary education sector, we realized we had to give them help because they will need to find jobs in May or jobs uh, for the summer. So we're introducing the Canada Emergency Student Benefit. Now, we will also be looking at seniors' situations. We have already brought in some measures to help them, but we will be doing more, and we will have more to say about that in the coming days. And finally, Prime Minister, in terms of those awful events that happened over the weekend in Nova Scotia, I'm wondering if your government is looking at introducing federal guidelines for how to deal with an active shooter. Uh, I think there are uh, many families that are grieving incredible losses right now uh, who are asking themselves questions about uh, how things could have been different, how uh, they might have been able to have been warned earlier. Uh, those are extremely important questions that I know will be addressed uh, through the investigation and through the conclusions. Uh, we need to make sure we're doing everything we can every step of the way uh, to protect citizens uh, in any circumstances. Uh, and I know those are, those are things that we will be reflecting on and talking about as a country in the coming years, in the coming days and weeks. Merci. Merci, c'est ce qui m'a fait la conférence de presse aujourd'hui. All right, that is the Prime Minister of Canada today wrapping up his uh, COVID-19 uh, briefing to the nation. The announcement today, all about students and making sure that they can get access to money uh, and jobs, uh, as we know that this has been an issue for many students. And I'll, I'll go in through the details with my colleagues after 12 o'clock, but I want to make sure to get a student's reaction, if I can, right away. Keegan Blackmore is a first-year law student at McGill University, and he was listening closely there uh, to what the Prime Minister had to say. Keegan 
Keegan, uh, did that sound like anything there will be able to help you immediately? Yes, uh, truthfully, I do think that this is a very encouraging figure, nine billion total. And I do like particularly the fact that you can have a tandem of supports. So you can have the student benefit and then you can also seek outside uh, you know, resources or volunteer experience. So I think that that's very encouraging. So you're a first year law student. So you would have been, would you have been looking for work in your field or you would have just taken any kind of job sort of thing? Well, originally I had been looking in a legal field. I do also have some experience in policy analysts, uh, analysis, sorry. So that would have been a field that I was looking at. But after the COVID experience, uh, I did start to fall back on my undergrad degree, but I still was unable to find any uh, employment. And what do you what do you use your summer job money for? I know everybody sort of uses it differently. How important is it for you? For myself, I'm one of the students, and I'm sure that there are many out there who does require the uh, fund funding in order to pay for his education. I funded my uh, my undergrad, and now I'm doing the same for my law degree. So having employment during the summer is an essential aspect of my summer experience. So the, there's the twelve fifty uh, per month uh, for May to August, but there's also, as you said, the opportunity to try and get a job as one of these frontline essential kind of jobs in those fields. Is that something that you would perhaps look at now? Absolutely. Any way to uh, make my life easier in terms of my financial base, uh, I will be looking at volunteering, and I do think that uh, having the grant in place for next summer, or sorry, next school year, also. Mm -hmm will allow me to have some more financial freedom in the times. What what would have happened if, because I know there was a lot of concern from students on Twitter, people were at me every day saying, we don't qualify for the CERB because we didn't make $5,000 or we just didn't have a job uh, that we lost due to COVID. So that was one or the other. What what would have happened if you if there had been no package, nothing offered to you at all? Well, the primary thing that I've been doing is applying for scholarships through McGill and I'm sure that other students have been doing the same, but for the most part, it would have been taking on some sort of loan or uh, maybe a line of credit in order mm. to be able to continue my education, which obviously brings with it interest and a, a bunch of other consequences. So it would have been quite tough. Quite yeah, tough. yeah, I would imagine. And lots of people, I know it was my case, you can't always turn to your parents for help either. So that wasn't an option yeah. for you either. No, it was not. No. So uh, how, how do you feel knowing that this is going to be, I think, up and running by May, the beginning of May? Is that, uh, is that good enough? How are you feeling about it? So I am quite encouraged, as I said. Um, I do think that uh, there may still be some gaps present, particularly for students who are in the more expensive provinces, Ontario, mm -hmm. BC. Um, but I do think, as I said, the, the fact that you can have both um, the emergency fund and then also some sort of funding through volunteering will try to uh, will hopefully mitigate some of these gaps. Um, but it's a, an encouraging first step. But I do think that there still may be some gaps. Anything, anything that you would uh, see yourself doing in terms of volunteer work or, or one of the, the jobs that the prime minister was talking about? Honestly, uh, farming sounds quite uh, interesting. I <laughs> do have a, a background in athletics. So I'm, I'm not averse to rolling up the sleeves and getting out there and doing whatever I can to support both Canadians, fellow Canadians, and then also myself. So farming, but contract tracing, any way that I can help with the current efforts, I will be uh, exploring. Well, you're, you're the perfect example of what they want, Keegan. So uh, I, hope, I hope that all comes through for you. Thanks for giving us your perspective right away. And I'm, I'm wishing you all the best now that you know uh, you have a little more security to count on in the months ahead. Thank you very much. It was my okay. pleasure. Okay, that's Keegan Blackmore. He's a first year law student at McGill University. Um, let me just wrap up some of what the Prime Minister had to say as we end our coverage here on CBC Television and switch over to CBC News Network. Um, as you heard there from Keegan, it is a $9 billion package that the government announced today targeting um, students. So $1,250 per month from May until August will now be available for students 
and there are certain criteria, but it is pretty open-ended. That is essentially the student version of the CERB, which we now know at least six million, six million, seven million Canadians have applied for. The government will also, it says, create 76,000 jobs for students, and this will target essential jobs that are needed right now uh, to deal with the pandemic, and including, as, as you just heard there from Keegan, the possibility of getting students to work in the farming industry. They also will, the government will also extend scholarships and grants by three to four months. They will uh, also create a grant called the Canada Student Services Grant. So if you go out to volunteer at one of the places that need help right now, you'll get paid anywhere between $1,000 to $5,000. And finally, for low-income students getting grants, those grants will now be doubled from $3,000 to $6,000 going forward, meaning depending on what province you are in, you might end up having your tuition near free uh, for the year ahead. Okay. That is our coverage here on CBC Television. We'll get into questions and more details at the top of the hour on CBC News Network. I'm Rosemary Barton. Thank you for watching. Hello again, I'm Rosemary Barton here in Ottawa. Thanks for joining us on CBC News Network, streaming around the world wherever you are on the CBC News app and cbcnews.ca. Ottawa has just rolled out a raft of new funding for young people, for students to help them through the pandemic. The Prime Minister has just announced a new emergency student benefit. It will put $1,250 in their pockets every month from May till August. He also said the federal government is creating 76,000 new jobs jobs. Uh, in addition, as well, to the Canada Summer Jobs Program, we'll have all the details on that, obviously. Also of note, because many of you have written to me about this, there is more help on the way for seniors, the Prime Minister confirmed today, uh, and we'll, of course, uh, follow that up closely. We are, though, also still following the situation in Nova Scotia. Anger is building over why a provincial emergency alert was not issued uh, when the gunman was on the loose over the weekend. We are now hearing that a warning did go out from the U.S. consulate in Halifax to dual citizens in the province. The RCMP sent out a tweet on Saturday night and early Sunday morning. Let's go now to uh, port a -Pic. That is where the violence began over the weekend and it's where Brett Ruskin is today and he's got some new details for us, Brett. Well, some new details uh, according to court records about this suspect. We now know CBC News has learned through these court records that he was actually convicted of an assault back in 2001. He was conditionally discharged uh, under the understanding and the promise that he would not uh, possess weapons or explosives for a period of nine months. It would also go into anger management counseling. So this is just a bit more information about this suspect. Uh, but in terms of the, the actual investigation itself, again, port uh, behind me here, you can see a couple of police vehicles there. There have been police investigators coming in and out all day long. This is one of 16 different sites across the province. Investigators uh, are still, you know, combing through the scene. In some cases, the scenes involve buildings that have been completely destroyed by fire. They are combing through them very carefully. There was an excavator that was on site yesterday to begin kind of slowly taking apart that, that rubble and the remains, possibly looking for any additional casualties in this mass murder. And so uh, we're taking a, a look at and, and waiting for any updates from RCMP. Um, we're told that there might be a news release, uh, possibly a news conference, but at least uh, some, some text information at the very least coming out today. Okay, Brett Ruskin in port pic Nova Scotia, continuing to track that important yeah. story there for us, and we will check in with you as you get more news. Appreciate it. As we stand by for the cabinet ministers uh, and public health officials briefing here in Ottawa, let me bring in my colleagues, uh, the host of Power and Politics, uh, Vashi Capellas, and the CBC's David Cochran, to go through some of these uh, significant measures announced today by the government, really very, very focused on students who, as the Prime Minister rightly pointed out, are coming to the end of their school year uh, with no prospect uh, of work or very little prospect of work for many of them. $9 billion uh, in terms of the total package. Vashi, uh, what part stood out for you there? 
Yeah, I'll go over the, all the student stuff in one second. Just quickly on what you were talking about with sure. Brett, though, and, and the issue of whether or not an alert should have been issued. Yes. Uh, the Prime Minister did touch on that at the end yes. of his press conference and recognized that there are questions around that, and, and specifically uh, a question related to the timing of that and if it should have happened and would it have made a difference. He, he said that the investigation would take place and address that, but I did think it was uh, significant that the Prime Minister noted that those sure. questions do exist right now. On students, uh, you know, a very big announcement for them today obviously the uh, impact of it still as yet to be judged you heard from that we heard from that student you interviewed who seemed to think it would help him to mm -hmm. a degree the marquee part of all of this is uh, another one of those emergency benefits it seems like they're they're somewhat all term this right now but this one the Canada emergency student benefit $1,200, $1,250 a month for students who don't qualify for the CERB. And the big part of the CERB that makes it hard for them to qualify is that they had to have made at least $5,000 in the last 12 months. Uh, this is then for them, $1,250 a month, I should say, sorry, and then up to $750 a month for eligible students who, uh, with dependents rather, or disabilities. So a bit more from them. You went over some of the other stuff, a uh, doubling yep. of grants, as well as uh, more job placements. They, the government says through the Canada Summer Jobs Program, that is something they previously announced, but they added to kind of, they had set up to $70,000, now they're saying $76,000. Uh, and also a grant as well for students who choose to volunteer through all of this. So some more opportunity for them to access money that they wouldn't have been able to access uh, prior to this. I think that, you know, again, we'll have to see how, how much it helps. It is less than the CRB. It's only it's twelve fifty, not two thousand, but it still is a lot more than they, they were going to be able to access yesterday. Uh, the other thing that I wanted to highlight actually was something that jumped out at me and that is around gun legislation. Uh, and the the change in posture from the Prime Minister today, who yesterday acknowledged that was something they were ready to introduce, uh, more gun control legislation. They have campaigned on it. They talked about it last year. He said that he's uh, willing to talk to opposition parties about kind of changing the rules of Parliament right now, which is structured to only deal with COVID-19 related legislation and see if they were open to introducing that prior to uh, prior in this sort of session or in this sort of sitting, which I think is is a, a something new that I've heard. From, I haven't heard that yet from the prime minister. I don't know at what stage those discussions are at, but there are sort of political cleavages on this issue, right? Yes. The conservatives would not support that legislation. I don't know in its what form it would take. So it, it depends on the, whether the opposition parties will as well. But that would be a, a very interesting uh, movement as well. Yeah, that, that definitely was new. Hard to see how uh, they would reach some sort of compromise in a reduced parliament to uh, pass legislation that would be highly controversial uh, for some parts of the country anyway, who would who would take issue with a ban on, on some assault rifles that have already been approved and are already in the hands of, of some Canadians. I, I I would be very curious to see how that would happen. I mean, I think you would need that's the kind of that's the kind of example where you would need sort of full representation of the country to best reflect how Canadians feel about about yeah, gun laws. Yeah. So anyway, you're, but you're right. Uh, interesting. That we also don't know many of the details. Yeah, just quickly, we also don't know many of the details about what happened in Nova Scotia. Actually, most of them we don't that's know. Right. We don't know about yeah. the firearms or firearms that were used. Uh, so the, the link between that legislation and, and the crime that took place, obviously there could be one very likely, yes, but yes. we don't know it for certain. No, we don't. Uh, but uh, in in instances like this, mass mass murders, you do tend to ask about For about sure. gun control, and that's why we're doing that as well. David, I, I I'll let you go where you want, but I did think one of the interesting things about the announcement today was the ability to or the the intent to try to help students uh, who won't get jobs, but also to push those students to the places that the economy mm -hmm. and society needs needs the help, whether it be volunteering, agriculture. As we heard from our our friend at McGill, there, he's happy to go plant things. I mean, I think that that. That's sort of an interesting way to um, solve a couple of problems at once. Yeah, there's kind of two things that students are dealing with here, and that's lost income, obviously, but also lost opportunity, right? Like your, your summer jobs and the jobs you work part-time while you're in uh, higher education certainly help you uh, build pathways to careers post-graduation. And one of the ways you can do that is through volunteering and, and, and getting jobs semi-related to your field, because you usually need to finish your education to get the job completely related to your field. So you have sort of a CERB light here, right? A CERB light that is $12.50 a month up to $17.50 a month if you're disabled or have a dependent as a student. And then student aid changes to make it easier for people to qualify uh, for student loans and a doubling of student grants, which in particular will help a lot of low-income people pay for their tuition for the upcoming year. And then there's the student employment aspect of this, 
there, there was the, the, the changes made to the Canada Student Jobs Program that were rolled out earlier. Now 76,000 jobs on top of it. The news release we've just gotten from the government says this suite of programs will create up to 116,000 jobs, placements, and other training opportunities to help students find employment and develop valuable skills. So it's, so it's on is, top of the thing from last week? Absolutely. This okay, is in addition right. to it. So there's an extra 75,000 jobs on top of the Canada Student Loan Program. Is, mm -hmm. or in a, it, it all adds up to 116,000. I'm not going to sure. walk through the math because I'll, I'll, I'll get something wrong. Um, so this tries to cover up some of the system gaps. Mm -hmm. uh, the problem, the criticism with the way the government is doing this is that there's time gaps. What did we hear again today? Help is coming for seniors. That's coming mm -hmm. soon. So that's yet another announcement. So the New Democrats in particular have been saying, why don't you just make this universal? Mm -hmm, it's a mm -hmm. question that they deal with all the time. If they had done that, the money would be rolling to all of these people by now through the uh, CERB program that was out there. But instead, they've tried to make it targeted and specific rather than totally universal and giving a pile of money to people who completely don't need it. So the way they're being creative with students, uh, what they think is an effective way, is you have a combination of measures. If you're a student, or if you graduated even in December, so if you finished your program at the end of 2019, you qualify for the 1,250 bucks a month from May to August, you can work and make up to another thousand and still get that benefit. And my understanding, and I'm seeking clarification on this from the Prime Minister's office, is that you can also volunteer on top yeah. of that yeah. and get extra hours and get extra money of up to $1,000 to $5,000 as compensation for your volunteer time. So this benefit plus a part-time job plus volunteering you can cobble together a decent living which gives you some experience and volunteer service in a time of crisis and a pandemic for the average student. There mm -hmm, are going to be mm -hmm. students with like children and disabilities that are going to sure. require extra help on this and we need to see precisely the interaction of all of these programs and the grants and how that sort of constellation of aid comes together and what sort of picture do we get there. Mm -hmm. uh, but certainly it's the reaction on social media from student leaders at, at different universities. Uh, they see this a, as a big help, uh, though like everybody in this pandemic, Rosie, no one program is going to solve everything. No. People are still losing no. in this. There's just no way around it. That's right. And, and to the people on, on, on Twitter as well who were saying, well, you know, this is helping me, but I still have student loans. Well, reminder yeah. that those loans have been suspended, at least the federal Six portion months. of those yeah. loans, until September. Um, and, and so, you know, it might be enough for, for many people, but I take your point. With these policy moves, generally there are gaps, and as the gaps get exposed, uh, the government does try to solve for those as well, because the idea is to make this as broad as possible, not as specific as possible. Although, to David's point, if you wanted to do that, the universal income benefit, as the NDP has been suggesting, uh, would have done just that, but it would have captured probably people making too much money and not in need of it. Okay, here is Christia Freeland, the Deputy Prime Minister, uh, with today's briefing of Cabinet Ministers and Public we would like to also highlight that it's the start of Ramadan shortly. In order to protect your friends and family this Ramadan, please stay home. It is essential that we not waste our collective e efforts. Please meet virtually instead. There are also multiple Canadian organizations, for example, FASN6, that are working hard in order to create a virtual community this Ramadan. Muslims in Canada and around the world will mark the beginning of the month of Ramadan. This Ramadan, in order to protect your family, your friends, and your neighbors, please stay home. We must not squander our country's collective hard work. This does not mean you have to celebrate Ramadan alone. Virtual iftar gatherings can still take place, and many Canadian groups, such as Fast in the Six, are working to bring together a virtual community this Ramadan. So, today, we will hear from Canada's Chief Public Health Officer, Dr. Theresa Tam. By video link, the Minister of Employment, Workforce Development and Disability Inclusion, Carla Qualtro, is joining us. We have the Associate Minister of Finance, Mona Fortier. Also by video link, uh, the Minister of Diversity and Inclusion and Youth, Barta Shager, is joining us. Et le Président du Conseil du Trésor, And the Chair of the Privy Council, Jean-Yves Duclos. Dr. Howard New. So, Dr. Tam, please. 
Hello, everyone, and bonjour à toutes et à tous. Hello, everyone. Let's start, as usual, with the latest numbers on COVID-19 in Canada. There are now 38,422 confirmed cases, including 1,834 deaths. We have tested over 576,000 people to date, with about 6.5 per cent testing positive. As we continue to make progress in slowing the spread of COVID-19, we are seeing some bumps in the road that reminds us we can't let down our guard. We've got to act quickly with this virus to address weak points before the virus jumps ahead of us again. The first hard lesson we learned was seeing how one or two cases in a long-term care setting could quickly accelerate into larger outbreaks with devastating consequences. But this was just the start of what has grown into a bigger problem and a driving force behind the epidemiology of COVID-19 in Canada's most hard-hit provinces. The risk factors in these types of settings aren't new. The fact is that the risks of epidemics in spaces with large populations that share common areas and can't maintain optimal physical distancing are at risk of outbreaks. If we are to control the COVID-19 epidemic, we must contain the spread and stamp out the burning embers that can lead to new chains of transmission. To prevent similar outbreaks in shelters and other crowded living conditions, we've got to build up protections and address vulnerabilities. The risk factors in this type of setting aren't new. The fact is that in closed spaces with large populations that share common areas and can't maintain optimal physical distancing are at risk for outbreaks. If we are to control the COVID-19 epidemic, we must contain spread and stamp out the burning embers that can lead to new chains of transmission. To prevent similar outbreaks in shelters and other crowded living conditions, we've got to build up protections and address vulnerabilities. To switch gears, I would like to take a moment to recognize National Volunteer Week and express my thanks to the countless Canadians who are giving up their time to help during these difficult times. Whether you are reaching out by getting groceries or medicines for our elders, putting together hygiene kits for people experiencing homelessness, finding new ways to keep vulnerable populations involved in programming or providing care packages and support to essential workers on the road and on the front lines. Your support and kindness matter, providing much needed care to sustain our spirits and shared humanity. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Dr. Tam. And now we will hear from the Minister of Employment, Workforce Development and Disability Inclusion, Carla Qualtro. Carla, please. Thank you. Hello, bonjour. Our government continues to take unprecedented action to support all Canadians affected by COVID-19. Young Canadians face a series of challenges through this difficult time, whether it be interrupted studies, reduced work opportunities, or disruptions to summer co-op or internship plans. With the suite of measures we are announcing today, we are taking action. As post-secondary students are worried about how they will be able to afford tuition, food and rent if they can't find summer work. That's why our government is introducing a four-month Canada Emergency Student Benefit. Students who are not eligible for the CERB will be able to apply to receive $1,250 per month between May and August. Students with permanent disabilities and students with dependents could receive an additional $500 per month. We know you have additional expenses during this crisis, and we are here to support you. This benefit is designed to reach the vast majority of existing and newly graduated post-secondary students. In addition, we will expand eligibility for the Canada Student Loans Program for September. We will also double the value of Canada Student Grants and increase the cap on Canada Student Loans from $210 to $350 per week of study. 
I know that many young Canadians are anxious about their job perspectives for the summer, and they are looking for jobs in stable sectors. We announced temporary changes to the Canada Summer Jobs Program, and that's just the start. Existing federal employment, skills development, and youth programming to create up to 116,000 job placements and other training opportunities to help students find employment and develop valuable skills this summer and over the coming months. This includes expanding the student work placement program by creating more paid work placements across critical sectors like healthcare, food and agri-food retail and e-commerce. We're also introducing flexibilities to the youth employment and skills strategy creating placements for young Canadians in critical sectors, such as community services. And we are investing in bringing important wraparound services online through the Support for Student Learning Program, services like mentoring and tutoring for vulnerable young people to make sure that they are not further marginalized by COVID-19. We hope that these measures and others made as part of Canada's COVID-19 economic response plan will help young people weather the negative in economic impacts of this pandemic while ensuring their health and safety. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Carla. And now we'll hear from the Associate Minister of Finance, Mona Fourquet. Mona, s'il vous plaît. Merci. Alors que les Canadiens prennent des mesures thank you. As Canadians are fighting COVID-19, we recognize that many young Canadians are facing an unprecedented challenge. Students in youth is simple. We have your back. In addition to the measures announced by my colleagues today, we will be providing 291,000 0.6 million to support up to 40,000 student researchers and postdoctoral fellows through the federal granting councils. This funding would support a single semester extension for eligible students who intend to continue their studies, but whose research scholarships or fellowships are set to end between March and August 2020. En plus des mesures annoncées par mes collègues, on top of the measures announced by our, my colleagues, there will be $291,000 in order to support 40,000 student researchers through different federal organizations. This funding will allow us to prolong by one semester for students who would like to continue their studies but for whom their fellowships or scholarships are ended. We also know that the pandemic has impacted students and Indigenous youth in a unique way. That's why today's announcement includes $75.2 million in additional distinctions-based support to First Nations, Métis and Inuit post-secondary students. We know that this pandemic has a different impact on Indigenous students and young people. That is why $75.2 million will be offered for additional support based on the differences faced by First Nations, Indigenous and Inuit students. These new important support measures will help young Canadians to get through this crisis. This will allow Canada to come out of this stronger than ever. Thank you. Thank you, Mona. And now we will hear from the Minister of Diversity and Inclusion and Youth, Bardish Jager, also by video link. Bardish, please. And could we have a bigger image of Bardish, please, and could we be sure that she is not on mute? Am I, I think I'm here. Okay, we can hear Bardish, but could we try to make the image bigger? Bardish, can you start speaking? I'm told that may help. All right, good afternoon. Um, we okay. know COVID-19... Okay, excellent. Bardish, why don't you start again? It's perfect. Here we go. Good afternoon. Um, we know that COVID-19 does not discriminate and it has impacted every segment of our society and Canada's youth are no exception. My colleagues and I hear from young people across the country. My riding of Waterloo is home to three post-secondary institutions. We recognize that youth are not only students, they are also essential workers, entrepreneurs, parents, caregivers and more. Young people have concerns which include financial stability and food stability, professional experience, 
and job perspectives, housing and personal well-being and community well-being are new supports and enhancements to programs such as the Canada Service Corps. This program is designed to connect young people aged 15 to 30 with opportunities to serve. We're increasing the number of available microgrants from 1,800 to 15,000. These grants enable young people to design and put into action projects that will make a positive difference in their communities. Because people who live and work in their communities know them best. For example, Omar of Montreal, Quebec was granted $1,500 to provide meals to residents severely impacted by the coronavirus. In the coming weeks, we will launch a new Canada Service student grant. Students who get involved to help respond to COVID-19 crisis will be provided with up to $5,000 to support their post-secondary education costs this fall. Nous savons que les jeunes ont des besoins différents. We know that young people have different needs, which is why the options we have Canadians have the supports they need to both help their communities and to gain valuable skills and experience. Thank you. Merci. Okay, thank you, Bardish. Et maintenant, je donne la parole au président du Conseil du Trésor, Jean-Yves Duclos. Jean-Yves Duclos, the floor is yours. Thank you, Christian. Hello, everyone. I would like to start by speaking directly to students who are listening to us from home. Today, our government is putting forward measures that will allow you to weather this crisis. We are aware that you are concerned, and we completely understand. Our youth, our students are our future, and we have heard you. I spent most of my career teaching you and helping you to prepare for life outside of the classroom. I understand that this situation can be stressful and difficult. We are going through an unprecedented crisis, but with the Prime Minister's announcement, as we promised, the government is offering you the support and the opportunities that you need in order to get through this crisis and to keep moving forward. We are teaching students and trying to prepare them for life outside of the classroom. I understand how difficult and stressful the current situation must be for them. These are challenging times, but with today's announcement made by the Prime Minister, as promised, our government is providing Canadian students the support and opportunities they need to get through this crisis and keep moving forward. For the students in Quebec who nous écoutent. For students in Quebec who are listening to us, I would like to confirm that you will also be eligible for this emergency response benefit for students. Furthermore, and that said, as you know, Quebec has its own system for loans and bursaries. And I would like to be clear, the government of Quebec will have access to a specific transfer in order to help Quebec students. Thank you. Thank you, Jean-Yves. And we are now ready to answer your questions. Thank you, Deputy Prime Minister. We'll start with three questions on the phone before turning to the room. One question, one follow-up. Operator. Thank you. Merci. Please press star one at this time if you have a question. S'il vous plaît, appuyez sur étoile 1 maintenant pour poser une question. The first question, la première question, est de Marie Vastel du Devoir. Please go ahead and vous la parole. Hello. My question is for Minister Duclos or Madame Qualtro. Je pense que oui, Carla parle très bien. I think that's fine. Carla speaks French very well. Thank you. Regarding the measures that were announced today for students, you've stated that this benefit will apply to those who would be starting their studies in September. I would like to ask, does this include secondary five students who would be entering CJEP in September? And does this also include people who may have taken a break from their studies, so who haven't been studying in the past year, but who would be starting a bachelor's degree or a master's degree in September? Does it apply to them as well? Carla? Hello. My answer to both questions is yes. If you are going to CEGEP in September, you can qualify. If somebody is starting or continuing their studies in September, they are eligible. Perfect. Thank you. And regarding Quebec now, 
The press conference stated that you would be doubling budgets for grants for students and Quebec would be compensated. How much money would Quebec be receiving in order to offer its own financial assistance to students. Carla or Jean-Yves, who would like to respond? Carla? I don't have the exact amount, but I can assure you that it will be fair. It will double grants and loan amounts. We will be having these discussions with Quebec and with the other provinces that are not using our system. But absolutely, this number will be doubled and fair. Thank you. Thank you. Next question. The next question, the prochaine question, is de Raymond Fillon de TVA. Please go ahead. À vous la parole. Oui, bonjour. Hello. The union for the border say that uh, immigrants would be able to cross the border. I, uh, the prime minister was not able to answer my question this morning. Uh, can you talk about these changes to the reg regulations? I can give you the information that I have. We renewed the agreement that we have with the United States for 30 additional days. So this is the border agreement. This agreement restricts travel only to essential travel because of COVID-19 and because of the realities faced in Canada and the United States. We made the right decision and we've stated that staying home is the best way to maintain the health and safety of our citizens. This agreement, as you know, includes an agreement between Canada and the U.S. Canada can redirect asylum seekers to the United States. I would like to assure you that through this agreement with the United States, Canada will maintain all of its international obligations. Raymond, you stated that migrants would be redirected towards the United States because they are not essential travelers. Do you turn them towards the United States or are they welcomed in Canada? I don't quite understand your answer. Have things changed? Answer. No. Canada's position has not changed. And I would like to be very clear. Canada is taking its international obligations quite seriously regarding refugees, including regarding turning people towards the United States. I would like to reassure Canadians that this agreement that we have the United States with the United States regarding turning asylum seekers towards the United States is not compromising our commitments. That's all. Thank you. Next question on the phone. Thank you. The next question, the question question, is de Lima Dib de la Presse Canadienne. Please go ahead. Have you la parole? Oui, uh, bonjour. Hello. I have a question regarding assistance for students. Will this be offered to Canadian students abroad or only those who are here in Canada? Why did you decide of the amount, that specific amount, instead of offering the same $2,000 that is offered to workers who are not students? Answer. I think that is an, a question for Carla. Carla, would you like to respond? Yes. Students need to be studying in Canada in September. It is not for students studying abroad. The amount of $1,250 was chosen because of other services that students have 
access to over the summer through the Canada Student Loan and Canada Student Grant. Your French is very good, Minister Qualcho. My next question has to do with something completely different. Prisons. From the beginning, you've said that you are following the situation, that you are trying to protect that population. We were talking a moment ago about certain areas in which people are too close together. Now, there are issues regarding situations in prison. How did we get here? Why were we not able to better protect convicts? Thank you for your question. And perhaps Dr. Tam would like to add an answer after my answer. We stated from the beginning that prisons and that prisoners are a vulnerable population because of the reality of conditions in prisons. We are taking the situation very seriously in the different prisons. The Minister Blair talked about this during our committee meeting yesterday. We are working closely with provincial authorities, especially in British Columbia. We have taken additional measures in order to protect prisoners and those who work in those institutions. For example, masks were sent for those working in prisons. Perhaps Dr. Tam would have something to add? Dr. Murat. Thank you for the question. Monsieur Letrain, at the Public Health Agency of Canada, we worked closely with our colleagues in the provinces and territories. A prison in BC put a specialist on the field, a nurse who specialized in prevention and the spread of diseases in order to offer support to prison staff. We are also continuing to work closely with our colleagues from the different departments in order to ensure that there is a program to prevent infections, and we want to have these programs in all prisons that fall under federal administration. Thank you. Good morning, uh, Tonda McCharles, Toronto Star. Um, Dr. Tam, uh, we've heard provinces like Saskatchewan, Alberta, BC talk about their keenness to reopen soon. Um, but looking at the testing numbers and your emphasis on the need for mass testing before we reopen, can you talk about what you see would be the optimum testing level? What capacity do you want to see? We're only now at uh, not even 20,000 a day the other day you said, but are, are the numbers you post online suggest that we're far from widely testing in Canada. So what's the optimum number? How do you see that unrolling? I think, interestingly, not the majority of countries don't actually have an optimal number, but we do need to have a bit of a target to work with. I know that uh, we collaborate across Canada with provincial and territorial laboratories and that the capacity um, right now can increase to triple that amount, essentially, to uh, close to 60,000. Um, and we need the whole system to be working and people um, being tested. Um, but there are uh, essentially an increase in capacity uh, being built uh, within the province and territories. Uh, we are continuing to, of course, provide supplies and figure out all lines of supply, whether it's reagents or swabs, and that happens on a very daily basis, and we'd be able to um, satisfy the uh, requests of the province and territories. So I think that's just the first layer. Uh, we are trying to ascertain how much um, of the uh, point of care testing um, devices that we can acquire. So Spartan is just one of them. That's the Canadian company. But we are acquiring international um, sources as well. And so those um, are expected um, to be distributed um, across the country. Uh, but uh, targeting uh, 
at the more rural and um, areas where they can't access uh, bigger labs um, right now. So we are, at the moment, working out um, some of the optimal uh, lab testing strategy going forwards, and that is just on the virus testing. Um, and as the serologic testings come on board, we'll also be looking at how do we best use those um, to ascertain the level of immunity in the population. But then, once they're validated, uh, what their role is in terms of the actual um, support to our diagnostics as well. So it is a bit of a um, um, target in evolution, but as a first tranche, um, roughly close to 60,000 is where the provinces um, can uh, potentially expand to uh, as a target already. So just to clarify that 60,000, you mean that's a national figure per day, is so it? You're not saying in each province that wants to reopen? That's the national. Okay. Yes. And just, um, you mentioned the serological testing, and I'm uh, curious to how close you think Health Canada is to approving those, because um, a number of provinces have talked that they're working with the national lab right now to do that and have mentioned within weeks. So how close are you to having those tests approved, and how do you see them working? Do you see them as um, something that is well down the road in terms of assessing population immunity? And given the reports we hear about asymptomatic transmission, uh, how crucial are they? Yeah, so um, as the first um um, application, I think, of serologic testing is to detect um, across Canada uh, what population had, in fact, been exposed to the virus, because we do know that lab-confirmed cases right now of the people who have presented or who have been tested is, is the tip of the iceberg. So serologic testing offers the opportunity to get a handle on what uh, the level of immunity may be. Uh, in Canada. So that's definitely one of the key uh, objectives. Um, I think uh, our lab is working really hard at validating um, the serologic tests uh, that are being presented. So, um, I think internationally we're aware that some of them actually don't work, so we want to make sure the ones that we have um, actually are effective and can detect um, and, uh, the antibody uh, response in uh, the Canadian population. It's quite an interesting process because we have to collect, of course, plasma or serum from actual confirmed cases and then validate it against people who don't have it um, from um, as a, a negative uh, control. Those are just some of the studies going on right now. But we expect that to be um, imminent in terms of uh, the completion of at least some of those um, um, diagnostics and offering. On top of things that can roll out, our National Microbiology Lab, of course, as a reference laboratory, can uh, is developing the confirmatory testing for serologic um, tests as well. Thank you, Dr. Kevin. Uh, this question is for Dr. Tam. Sort of following up on that, with Premier Ford saying today that there's a goal to reopen Ontario's economy around the May long weekend, with all the modeling data, knowledge about our capacity for testing, uh, and other figures that you're looking at right now, Dr. Tam, is it perhaps premature to be putting dates on? when the economy can reopen? And uh, are you at all concerned that premiers are starting to put goals uh, into when this can happen? Is this, is this the right time to do it? Well, I think every province and territory sees with the planning to look at the right uh, conditions or timing um, to um, look at what kind of public health measures um, can be eased off a bit. I think, as I've said, that we have to tread very carefully at this point. I don't think anyone is not heeding that uh, advice from a public health perspective, is that we need to see past the peak and then to, to come down the other side of the curve very carefully. Um, and anything can happen in any given day. So I think it is something that the province is re-evaluating all the time. Uh, but the other work that I am doing with the Special Advisory Committee of the Chief Medical Officers of Health is looking at some of the criteria from a health perspective as to what those indicators might be uh, in order to uh, assist in uh, some of those decisions. Can you elaborate on that then? So what are, what are the criteria? I mean, is it, is, it, is it too soon to be putting a date on when to reopen the economy, first off, was my question. 
and what are these criteria that you're dealing with when you're talking with chief public health officers around the country in terms of evaluating when it's appropriate to release or reduce some of these public health measures? Well, some of the criteria are fairly technical, but it essentially uh, we want to make sure that you're right at the bottom of that epidemic curve. So indications including things like hospitalization, the cases reported every day, um, some of the reproduction numbers, for example, uh, that's actually some of the, the type of things under discussion. Um, and But there's also other criteria in terms of ensuring that the health system is ready um, to absorb more cases should that occur, and that any outbreaks, in fact, of um, um, whether they be at long-term care facilities or others, are rapidly managed. So some some of the um, you know approaches from a public health perspective is to make sure those kind of um, measures are in place. And um, so that's actually under active discussion, and uh, we will be working really, really hard at that, recognizing where we're at in the epidemic in Canada. But do not let go of what we're doing now. That's the, um, I think, the most important message. Uh, as I've always said, that uh, there's a different kinds of epidemic going across the country. So the timing of the some of the measures and changes in the um, uh, what happens, um, there, there may be some variations in that. But we wanted to get a national approach in some of the um, public health uh, criteria. So that's what we're working on. Thank you, Dr. Mike. Good evening or morning. Uh, today, I, there's a there's a, thousands of Canadians in India right now that are are kind of trapped there, and we we're wondering today if uh, there's any plans. There's the plans to have these eight planes from Armatrack come and get them. How long, how far along are we on that? Um. We are very aware of the problems being faced by Canadians in India. Uh, speaking as an M a constituency MP, and there are two other MPs sitting here with me and two on video link, uh, one of the things that constituency MPs are in very close touch with is the personal situation of Canadians, and that's a really good thing. Uh, and we are working hard to bring those Canadians back. I will be candid with you, Mike, and with Canadians. Uh, this is complicated and challenging uh, because of the restrictions which are in place in India around the coronavirus. And I do also want to be quite clear that those Canadians coming back, that is not the end of the story. Uh, anyone who comes into Canada is subject to mandatory quarantine orders. And it is very important, you know, no matter how delighted and relieved people are to be coming home after having been in a difficult situation, it is essential that they quarantine as soon as they get here. And we're very focused on that too. Okay. And there was uh, members of the BC's Indo-Canadian community who were trying to arrange flights and that was, that was shut down. And we're wondering if it was on the Canadians end or they were, they had permits. To, to try to get some flights out of there. Was that shut down on the Canadians' end, uh, somewhere in India, or do we, do we have any more details on that? You know, Mike, it is a delicate and complicated situation, so I'm not going to go into the details, apart from particularly because uh, our objective needs to be not to do anything that would compromise the ability to get people home. But let me just say, uh, I am very sympathetic. We are very sympathetic with the concerns of people in Canada trying to get their friends and family home. And we are working very, very hard to help make that happen. And I do really want to emphasize the second part of that is people coming home have to, and they are legally obliged to isolate for 14 days. That's very important. And that's a very important piece we're committed to. And I do want to also really, uh, as you mentioned, BC, uh, thank the province of BC, which has been an excellent, very committed partner in ensuring the quarantine of everyone arriving into BC. 
Merci, Madame la Vice-Première Ministre. On va retourner au téléphone pour trois questions. Thank you. We're going to move back to the phone for three questions. The next question, la prochaine question, est de Mélanie Marquis de la Presse. Please go ahead. À vous la parole. Merci beaucoup. Thank you very much. My first question is for Ram Freeland. I would like to go back to asylum seekers at the border. I don't understand. You're saying that nothing has changed. However, in the decree that I have, one can see that the interdiction, the that if people come to Canada seeking asylum, that's not included. Can you explain that to me more, please? I believe that we were clear from the start. There is an agreement with the United States in order to restrict non-essential travel. One element of that agreement was a decision made between Canada and the United States which allows Canada to redirect individuals to the United States, so asylum seekers specifically. I know that there are Canadians, and that includes the government, that have concerns regarding this process, and I can assure you that through this agreement, we are maintaining our international commitments regarding refugees and that turnaround. I can assure you that in what we're doing, we are certain that we are maintaining our obligations regarding those who are turned to we sent to the United States. Melanie, yeah, follow-up question? I just want to understand, Madam Freeland, if an asylum seeker arrives at a regular border crossing and has no symptoms of COVID-19, will that person be able to enter the country? And if an asylum seeker tries to go through the Ruxham passage, what will happen to that person? The agreement that we have with the United States concerns non-essential travel. There are a lot of people who can travel from the U.S. to Canada and from Canada to the U.S. But some of these people are no longer allowed to enter into Canada. A new element regarding irregular asylum seekers is that irregular asylum seekers who try to take the Roxham path, for example, are redirected to the United States. I would like to highlight that we are doing things in a way that allows us to ensure proper turnaround of those people. Oh, sorry, next question on the phone. Thank you. The next question, la prochaine question, is from Jamie Pashagamska from APTN News. Please go ahead. La parole est à vous. Hi, thank you. Uh, my first question is concerning uh, modeling. Canada, it's been a couple of weeks now since they revealed uh, modeling data for Canada, but why is the government refusing to release modeling numbers for Indigenous communities? So we, uh, I just didn't catch the very last part of your question. Could you? Yeah, sorry. I was just wondering why uh, the government of Canada is not releasing numbers, modeling numbers for Indigenous communities. Um, so um, I think um, it is 
um, where we will collaborate with um, our indigenous partners is um, you know a tool that any um, departments and, and indigenous services Canada and can also utilize um, I think uh, just to re-emphasize that modeling is a planning tool so as long as it is useful for their planning purposes, I think they can be applied. Um, but um, that's a, they, they have a very unique situation, and I think um, that has to be done in full consultation with uh, communities or uh, individual uh, Indigenous uh, First Nations in your MAT uh, organisations as well. But it is, it is just a tool for um, any sort of planning or preparedness purposes. Jamie, follow up. Yes, thank you. Um, as my follow-up, I'd just like some clarification to the 700 and, uh, 75 million, sorry, for Indigenous students. Now, is this part of the nine billion that's earmarked um, for each for each of the categories? You said there was um, money for summer jobs. There was money for um, for to extend scholarships and such. Is this on top of that, or is this part of it? Okay, Carla, I think that's for you. Could you start again, Carla? We didn't hear you. Maybe unmute yourself. I did. Sorry about that. Yes, it is part of the, the, the broader $8.8 billion package that we announced today, um, including youth programming, Canada Student Loans, the new benefit, and of course, the service grants that my colleague talked about. So it's part of the bigger package, yes. Thank you, Minister. Thank you. Operator, next question on the phone, please. Thank you. The next question, the prochaine question, is de Micheline Laflamme de Radio Canada. Please go ahead. Avez-vous la parole? Merci beaucoup. Thank you very much, Madam Freeland. I would like to go back to asylum seekers at the border. This morning, the Union of Employees stated that changes happened yesterday and that the Hotel Saint-Bernard de la Colle was reserved for these asylum seekers so that they might spend 14 days in quarantine there before their request was processed. Is that true? Thank you again for the question. Our agreement with the United States has not changed. When we renewed this agreement for 30 days, the agreement was the same. It's the same as it was in March. Regarding what the union is saying, I have not spoken directly with the union. However, we will be talking with the Union or Minister Blair will do so in order to clarify information, but I can assure you that the agreement has not changed. Follow-up question? Yes, thank you. My next question regards swabs. In New Brunswick and Ontario and then Quebec, Quebec stated having received swabs that were contaminated. Are these swabs coming from the same provider who was problematic last time? Can you tell us that the necessary measures were taken so that that doesn't happen again? I will start, and perhaps Dr. New will have something to add, regarding swabs. They are an essential element for us because swabs are essential for testing. There was a problem 10 days ago with swabs received from China. When that happened, we made the decision to diversify the sources of swabs. Now, we work with different companies 
who send swabs to Canada. All right, we are going to pull away from our federal briefing from the Deputy Prime Minister and other cabinet ministers, giving us the details of what the government announced today. Perhaps I'll just highlight one of the things said by Dr. Theresa Tam, and that's in regard to testing, which we know is key to getting uh, the public health restrictions eased a little bit. And she believes the country can get up to 60,000 tests a day. We're at about 20,000 right now. Let me bring the CBC's David Cochran uh, as we wrap up our coverage here on, on the federal response to COVID-19. And again, just more details really about how students are being uh, offered some additional supports today, David. Yeah, it's really almost a four-part uh, aid program for students, uh, an income replacement program similar to the CERB, but for lesser amounts, student aid changes that will increase loans and make it easier to qualify, student employment changes, and then grants for volunteering. Uh, and the way it works is the, the income replacement is for anybody who's a post-secondary student now or graduated at the end of last year or is going to be a student in September. From May to August, $1,250 in income support is yours for the taking. If you sign up for this program, that can increase the 1750 if you're a student with a disability or with a, someone you have to care for. And you can also make up to $1,000 a month in a part-time job uh, on top of that and keep the full benefit. And Rosie, something I did get clarification on from the pri Prime Minister's office, you can get the income support, you can make $1,000 working, and the volunteer grants that they put on the table. People who volunteer, uh, particularly in areas that help deal with the battle against COVID-19, you can get a grant of up to $1,000 or $5,000 depending on your volunteer hours. You can get all three. So you can stack the income support on top of part-time job, on top of volunteer work that will give you valuable work experience and help you transition uh, in a time of crisis, and you can get all three levels of that. That's on top of the doubling of student grants that we've seen here for low-income students going into next year and, and making it easier to qualify for student loans. So a suite of things designed to paper over one of the big cracks that was left after the rollout right. of the CERB. And I'll just also mention the $75 million for First Nations, Métis, yeah. and, and Inuit students as well, so particular focus on them. Uh, David, thank you for your help with the coverage. Appreciate it. My thanks to Vashi Capellas as well. I'll also just let you know that the federal government says there is more support coming for seniors, and we know that that is something many of you have been asking about. But now I'll turn away from our coverage here in Ottawa and leave you for the day.